now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Science fiction, an episode of X-1, going back to June 19th, 1956. I think you'll enjoy this. It's called Project Trojan. In just a moment, X-1. But first, a quiz program does not always improve your IQ. But what's an NBC radio quiz program? Well, you can be sure it'll improve your disposition. Yes, NBC offers listeners a laugh lesson every Wednesday night with two fun-filled question-and-answer shows. One is Truth or Consequences, and though you may never learn why a chicken crosses the road, you'll howl as contestants perform the stunts dreamed up by MC Jack Bailey. The other is You Bet Your Life, and with a quiz master like Groucho Marx, your good time is always guaranteed. Hear Truth or Consequences and You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx tomorrow. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Project Trojan by Ernest Canoy. Most of the greatest contributions and biggest messes in history have been made by two kinds of brains, the devious and the literal. We quote from the monthly column written for Galaxy by its editor, H.L. Gold. For our story tonight has been inspired by one of his recent columns, discussing the exceedingly thin line that sometimes lies between science fiction and science fact, and of the strange use that both Allied and German intelligence made of science fiction during the recent World War II. Our report, of course, is entirely fictional. But similar schemes are known to have been attempted by both sides. And now, here is Project Trojan. The idea of Project Trojan was originally conceived in February of 1943. The Intelligence Plans Commission, an adjunct to Joint Army and Naval Intelligence, was under the command of Colonel Sir Harold Bostwick. The first antecedent of Project Trojan occurred on an afternoon in February. Corporal Arthur Muggeridge was serving tea to Lieutenant Maurice Withering and Captain Amos McKenzie. Here you are, sir. That's real butter on the bread. I won five pounds of it from one of those yank mess sergeants over at the Crown of Land. Oh, butter, eh? Aye, sir. Mackenzie. Hmm? Well, confounded, man, you might show some interest. Here, Muggeridge tangles with the Eighth Air Force to improve your tea, and you sit there reading. What the devil is so engrossing? No, never mind. If it's me you're worrying about, you needn't, sir. I was cleared for most confidential and top secret before I set foot in the pantry. Uh, what is it, Mackenzie? Well, I was reading about a fascinating notion. It's a machine, you see, dreadfully ingenious. It's a method of setting up a reverse polarization field about a given metallic surface, say, uh, the plates on a submarine or a tank. Makes them five times as strong. Uh, A little more cream, Muggeridge. It's powdered milk, sir. Uh, Hush, leave me to my illusions. But, Mackenzie, how can you be so calm? Uh, Don't you realize what this means? Tanks, five times as strong? Is it in production? I mean, when do the first models go into combat? 
It's certainly been a well-kept secret. I wouldn't say that. There's about 50,000 people who know all about it here in England. And, of course, a great many more in America. Oh, that's impossible. But I doubt if it will ever be used in combat. But you're stark raving crackers, a secret like this. Where did you find this? Now, let me see that. There you are. I... Incredible science fiction. It's an American magazine. You mean this is a story, one of those Jules Verne things? You've been pulling my leg. I? Well, I... I mean, after all... Well, Captain Mackenzie, I hardly think that... Well... Now, don't get stuffy, man. After all, do... Chaff me before the ranks. Uh, oh, I don't mind, sir. But it did have you going, didn't it? Well, it sounded plausible. I, I don't know a confounded thing about electrical fields. And even if you did, it might take you in. Huh? You, you see, the trick these science fiction lads do is to take something that's solid as a rock and then to push it just a wee bit forward till you simply can't tell where the science ends and the fiction begins. Mm, still, I, I wish you'd exercise your ingenuity in deceiving Jerry rather than me. Good Lord. That's a fine idea. What is? If an intelligent, brilliant officer and gentleman like yourself might be taken in by a wild tale like this, whom else's leg might we pull? Huh? A muggeridge, another bread and butter sandwich, if you please, and um, uh, take one yourself. <laughs> Lieutenant Withering and Captain Mackenzie worked out preliminary plans for Project Trojan and presented them at an appropriate time to Colonel Sir Harold Bostwick. Well, sir, sit down, Withering, Mackenzie. Oh, thank you, sir. We had breakfast. I understand Corporal Magridge has been playing darts with the Yanks again, the refresh eggs for breakfast. Uh, we've had breakfast, sir. Oh, well, then. Uh, we have a plan, sir. Uh, oh, capital, capital. You remember, sir, our intelligence reports indicated a concentration of German research scientists working near Hanau. Uh, certainly, I recall. They've got the whole lot of them inside a mountain. We tried bombing. I doubt if they even noticed. Uh, they're supplying the basic research for the German guided missile program. Yes, we know that. The reaction motor for the V1s came out of the Hanau lab. Oh, Magridge! Oh, you see, sir... If a considerable number of those research scientists were diverted to another project, the rocket program would be crippled. Yes, well, of course it would. Uh, what are you going to do? Advertise in the Times and offer them high wages? I sir. Oh, Muggeridge, this coffee. Ah, uh, ah, uh, no, well, sir. Uh, next time you go to the Crown and Lance, keep coffee in mind, will you? Aye, sir. Only the Yanks are getting fair dabs at darts. It was touch and go with the eggs. Oh, we can only expect you to do your best. I'll try, sir. Well, now, come to the point, gentlemen. Uh, suppose the Germans got hold of one of our top new development weapons. Something so completely overwhelming that they'd have to pull almost every man off rockets to work on it. Now, look here, Mackenzie. Those jelly scientists are not exactly playing about with small boys' chemistry sets. They're a cut above our own chaps in several fields. What makes you think you could plant something on them? Science fiction, sir. I beg your pardon? You see this magazine? Yes. Incredible science fiction. I, oh, what's that chasing that girl there? Uh, that's a Martian, sir. You can tell by his tentacles. Mackenzie, are you stringing this along preliminary to a plan for compassionate leave on the grounds that you're overworked? No, sir. It's a good plan. We invent a weapon. A weapon that might exist, but doesn't. And we leave it lying about where the Germans can snaffle it. And then they take most of the scientist fellows off the rocket program to work on our weapon. And that's the most preposterous nonsense I've ever heard. But, sir... I don't want to hear anything more about it. Uh, uh yes, sir. I suppose she was right. Who was right? This Wren. I met her going up to London. Rather proper little type till you got to know her. Well, then she's rather a firebrand. Uh, Captain Mackenzie, please spare us the sordid details of your off-duty peculation. Uh, sorry, sir. You see, she's the secretary to Admiral Sir Alan Grummins. They're talking of dropping this unit. They feel that other intelligence groups are quite competent to handle the routine, unimaginative work that we've been doing. Oh, oh I see. Mm -hmm. Of course, they'd uh, reassign personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say this... Uh... This science fiction scheme of yours was uh, imaginative? Oh, it's practically visionary. Well, suppose you do some preliminary work. Thank you, sir. Routine, eh? Unimaginative, eh? Bah! Bah humbug indeed. June 19th, 1956, X-1 on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. 
It's just a different experience and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's healthcare bills. And it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in healthcare sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE, 833-34-BIBLE. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. More of X-1, Project Trojan, June 19th, 1956. On the 14th of February, preliminary work was begun on Project Trojan. At first, Lieutenant Withering and Captain Mackenzie worked alone, researching the source material of the project. Slamming the firing keys... Brick blasted down on the Krull warship. Bright beams of crisp destruction lanced out from the giant dreadnought and licked along the plates of Brick's one-man scout. Mm, nothing in that one. Uh, and what have you got? It's a story about two robots who fall in love. What's the name of that Johnny who came closest? Herman. Jad Herman. Mm. He got half a dozen ideas that are close. Where do you suppose he is? Mm, somewhere in the States, I suppose. Mm. That's no use, then. Why? Oh, look, man, perhaps we can put a query through Central Shafe Intelligence. The Yanks ought to be able to dig up this Herman chap for us. Oh, it's worth a try. It took seven days for a report to reach IPC that one Jacob David Herman, a private first class in the American Air Force, was based on a field north of Cheltenham in the Gloucestershire area. Lieutenant Withering and Captain Mackenzie requisitioned transport and visited Herman at his place of duty. You don't mind if I go ahead with my job, do you? I gotta have this place ready for inspection by 1300. Uh, go right ahead. Hand me the uh, cleaning powder, will you please? Oh, oh yes. Uh, anyway, say, so? uh, what do they put in porcelain in England? You break your arm trying to get it clean. Um, Private Herman, you are Jad Herman, a writer? Yeah, that's a that's, uh, pen name, Jad. I use it for SF stuff. I used to write for the Confessions under the name of Cynthia Herman. <laughs> I remember one article. I was saved by the YWCA from a life of shame. <clears throat> uh, we're interested in your science fiction articles at the moment. Oh, yeah? Well, I know we had some sci-fi fans in England. Oh, we're not exactly uh, sci-fi fans. Uh, we're from... Uh, anybody else here? Well, look for yourself. There's no hiding place down here. Well, um, we are from Intelligence Plans Commission. Uh-huh. Um, we need your assistance, sir, uh, Mr. Herman. No kidding. Yes, we have a project that, uh, calls for your particular talents. You got a latrine needs cleaning? We're quite serious, Mr. Herman. Will you kindly pack your things and be ready to come with us within one hour? Oh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I couldn't possibly leave until after inspection. I've got too much of myself invested in this latrine. But after that, I'm at your service. Private First Class Jacob D. Herman, 32962126, was transferred on special detached duty to Project Trojan and after briefing was set to work on basic plans. Oh, look, Mac, here's the way I see it. If you want to con a scientist, you've got to be pretty straight all the way. You can't get away with more than one phony step in the process. Precisely. Now, here's the way I see it. It's a focusing beam weapon. The electronics on that are square. I used it in a story about two years ago. Fine Schreiber at MIT and Temple and Westover at the Bell Telephone Laboratories worked out the basic field formulas. What do you mean it's real? Well, up to a point. Everything's on the level till you get to the catalytic action on the grid. Now, that just won't work. It's a basic problem in physics, and it well, makes the whole thing impossible. But don't the Germans know that? Oh, sure, sure. You see, you make up plans for the weapon. Call it a death ray. You let the Germans steal everything but the catalyst formula. They'll think we've got it licked, and they'll break their necks trying to duplicate it before we put the weapon in production. I see. But we can't call it a death ray... 
Well, how, how about uh, projector, electronic grid deflecting, type 3? Hmm, that has a brawl ring to it, my lad. I've got the uh, basic idea of the thing, but uh, you'll have to get some of your science boys to work it out. Oh, we'll put a requisition into the Manpower Commission in the morning. Doctors Montague, Felder, Harrison, Sisonby and Pilsudski were assigned to Project Trojan and under the direction of Private First Class Jacobs, complete specifications and plans for projector electronic grid deflecting type 3 were drawn up. Project Trojan was ready for phase 2. Have we got everything? Blueprints? Check. Specifications? Check. Machine tool inventories? Check. Letter rejecting the plans from the War Office? Check. Endorsement from Supreme Headquarters rejecting plans? Check. Note from 10 Downing Street overriding rejections, handwritten postscript... Build the confounded thing, W.C. Check. Uh, don't you think that's going a little too far, the rejections? Not at all. That's the master touch. A rejection of an idea by the war office makes it appear most genuine. All right. Uh, Private Herman, yeah. if this thing were real, if it could be built, what would it do? Oh, don't ask. You could blow a hole in a mountain ten miles away. Why, well, you could knock down a whole wing of bombers without even aiming. Oh, dear. Lucky it won't work. I should say so. Well, now to get this lovely thing into Jerry's hands. Phase three of Project Trojan was commenced on the 15th of March, 1943. Central Counterintelligence Agency had discovered the infiltration of a German agent, a Belfast Irishman named Gogarty, into the blueprint division of Clark and Porchester, a printing firm doing some subcontract work for the Air Ministry. Gogarty, the German agent, presumably microfilmed the plans because shortly thereafter he received word that his sister, living in the Irish Free State, was to be married to a bus conductor. British agents attending the wedding disguised as farm labourers lost track of Gogarty for several hours due to circumstances beyond their control. Then we have no way of knowing whether Gogarty delivered a Project Trojan plans. Uh, well, sir, there was a submarine sighted a day before off the coast. It's likely he made contact. Well, uh, keep me informed. Uh, that's all we need now, another disaster. Did something else go wrong? Oh, jolly well right. Muggeridge has been playing darts with the Yanks again. Oh? What have we got this time? Butter or beefsteak? Nothing. The blight has lost my whole month's whiskey ration. <laughs> Now the cover operation supporting Project Trojan was undertaken. A battalion of the Royal Engineers was detailed to practice at secret installations with wooden mock-ups of the projector. A lance corporal in this detachment, a volunteer afterwards awarded the George Medal, was court-martialed and sentenced to seven years hard labour for revealing information about the project while drunk on a three-day leave to Tynecastle. This particular aspect of Project Trojan has been in the news recently, inasmuch as several backbench Labour members of Parliament have asked questions in the House as it came out that the corporal served the full seven years and wasn't released until 1951. The Home Secretary explained that this was an unfortunate oversight and there were jeers from the opposition, with Mr. Anoidin Devon taking the occasion to call for the resignation of the government. At the time, March and April 1943, the Intelligence Plans Commission awaited reports from British operatives. Sir, there's been a shift in assignment at the research laboratories at Hanau. Professor Schlickmann and Drs. Hirsch, Mansulau and Grishman have been transferred from rocket research to another project. Trojan? We must assume so. But that's only four men. But they're the top experts in electronics, chemistry and metallurgy. If they're really working on Trojan, we've set the German rocket program back a year while their scientists go yelping off after a red herring. Well, let's hope so. Bring me any further reports as soon as received. <laughs> British intelligence reports filtering back through occupied Norway and neutral Sweden continued to indicate the success of Project Croton. Four more top scientists were known to be transferred from the rocket research base at Penaminde to the Hanau laboratories. Definite knowledge was obtained that the new assignment was a startling new weapon agreeing in detail with Project Croton. <laughs> what a Sally, McKinsey. What a stunt. Yes, sir. We shall have to have a little party to celebrate. We'll have that Herman chap in for a drink. I've been sending Muggeridge off to play darts with some of the free French over at Germain Manor. He ought to be back soon with the champagne. <laughs> Pour all round. 
Private Herman. Thank you. All right now, to the projector, electronic grid deflecting type 3. The biggest fraud is the South Sea bubble. <laughs> Colonel Bostwick. <laughs> oh, with him, take a glass. <laughs> We're just drinking to Trojan. Yeah, well, I think I'd rather not, sir. Uh, well, what do you mean? There's a dispatch from Germany. What about it? A section of the mountain overlooking Hanau has disappeared. What? It's true. It was on the reconnaissance maps yesterday, and it was gone this morning. A ten-mile slice of mountain. <laughs> That's impossible. No, it isn't. It works. Trojan works. But it can't. There's no catalyst. It's impossible. All our scientists said so. Well, I guess they were wrong. It works. They must have found the catalyst. I suppose we should have foreseen that. All those scientists working on it. They must have built the model and tried it out. It won't take them more than three months to put it into production. Well, here goes the war. Muggeridge. Aye, sir. Fill the glasses up again. Intelligence Plans Commission now waited for additional dispatches concerning the reaction to Project Trojan in Germany. Could this plan actually work? June 19th, 1956, X-1, Project Trojan. Thank you so much for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us? We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of X-1, Project Trojan, June 19th, 1956. It was decided as a matter of policy to confine knowledge of these latest developments to the personnel of the project. Anything new, Mackenzie? No, sir, except that aerial reconnaissance confirms the damage to the mountain at Hanau. It's not quite as extensive as the first dispatch, but uh, it is a bit of a hole. Oh, what do they think caused it? The Air Ministry seems to feel that an ammunition dump must have blown up. Couldn't that be it? I'm afraid not, sir. We have an intelligence report about several captured British and American tanks being brought to Hanau for testing. They were spotted the next day, completely destroyed. Trojan? Trojan. There's been an alert at factories producing parts for V-1 and V-2 rockets to prepare for retooling. They're going to make the projector? It would seem so, sir. Well, I suppose I'd better go up to London tomorrow make a clean breast of it. I'm afraid so, sir. Well, that's the end. Seems rather unsporting, doesn't it? Just handing the war over to them. I hate to think what the war office will say. Not to mention the Prime Minister. Project Trojan was nearing its closing phase. 
At precisely 0600 the next morning, Colonel Sir Harold Bostwick ordered his staff car and, taking a thermos of tea, proceeded to leave his office. Just before the staff car got underway, Lieutenant Withering appeared with another dispatch, accompanied by Captain Mackenzie and Private Herman. Colonel Bostwick, sir. Uh, wait. So what is it, Withering? Another dispatch. No, oh, don't please. It's bad enough. Uh, there's been another disaster at Hanar. They knocked another mountain with our little present to them? No, sir. They've knocked themselves out. What? The laboratory under the mountain. It's exploded. It has? It went up like a Roman candle. We've got pictures. There was a flight of mosquito bombers over at the time. What, what, what happened? The projector. It backfired. How do you know? It had to. That's why the catalyst is impossible. You see, the metal fatigue on the grid is a function of... Never mind, never mind. Are you sure? Yes, sir. We have a reliable agent's report. The Germans are completely confused. They were operating the projector under a top-secret designation. Nobody knew any of the details except the dozen scientists working on it. And they were inside the laboratory when it blew. Our man was in the rescue squad. There isn't a thing left, sir. Plans, models, or scientists. Sir, do you realize that Project Trojan was a success? We've diverted a dozen top scientists from the rocket program permanently. Or do you think we'll be decorated? Lieutenant Withering, Mm. inasmuch as we came particularly close to handing the whole war to the Germans on a silver platter, I suggest we forget Project Trojan. Oh, yes. Yes, I see, of course. You're very canny, sir. I think we had all better return to precisely what we were doing before the whole nasty mess started. The final phase of Project Trojan was completed on the 22nd of March, 1943. The file, through some inadvertent error, was lost before the Intelligence Plans Commission had a chance to report to the War Office. All personnel returned to their previous assignment. All right, all right, no splashing on the floor. I gotta get this latrine ready for inspection by 1300. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features the William Ten novelette, Time in Advance, the story of a man who made a strange bargain and endured the worst the galaxy had to offer, so that someday he could make the Earth sweat. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Project Trojan, an original story by Ernest Kinoy based on an idea contained in an editorial in Galaxy, written by H.L. Gold. Featured in the cast were Burford Hampton, Alastair Duncan, Ivor Francis, Alfred Shirley, Bill Quinn, and your narrator was Alfred Hislip. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. June 19, 1956, X-1 on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part two of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Perling Matter. This episode originally broadcast June 19th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford. Uh, hello? Hello, Mr. Scottman, Johnny Dollar. Hope I didn't get you up. Uh, no, no, no. I've been very anxious to hear from you. Well, I thought I'd better call, Mr. Scottman. I just found out that David Perling paid a reporter here in Key West to print that story about his death. Yeah, I see. I can be in New York at 7 tomorrow morning. 
Could you meet me there sometime? I can meet you in Idlewild. My plane comes in at 7.20. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. <laughs> Expense account continued. Item three, $98.09. .09. Airfare and incidentals, including board and room, Key West to New York City. Mort Scottman was in the airport coffee shop having tea and toast in the best tradition of a vice president. He looks shaved, rested, and fresh. Would you uh, like some breakfast, Mr. Dollar? Mm, just coffee for now, thanks. A cup of coffee, please. Well, we seem to have made nice connections. Not uh, 7.30 yet. Yeah. Mr. Scottman, the reporter in Key West who printed that story about David Perling was paid $100 in cash to do it. Perling paid her to file an erroneous story that he had been killed in a boating accident. You said uh, cash? Yeah, that's right, cash. No check. No way to prove it one way or another. Just the reporter's word. And she said she'd deny it if anybody else asked her. Disclaim the whole thing. Yeah, where does that put us? Well, look, Perling had to pay somebody to fire that boat. Probably the skipper, I don't know. But it's an angle if you're thinking about legal lines. It's very good. Of course, the boat would demand explanation. Well, let's let it go for the moment. I noticed a retraction disclaiming the story of Perling's death is in every paper this morning. It was in all of last night's papers, too. Now, if the story could affect the stock market, when would it show up? Today, at the latest. There was no action yesterday? Not on the exchange, no. How do you feel about this whole thing now? In view of the fact you've ascertained that Perling himself arranged for his own death report to be published, I can only assume that he did it for one reason. To take advantage of some brisk trading that would occur because of such a report. But there's been nothing of that so far. Hmm. Uh, tell me, Mr. Scotman, in the event this does happen, what would you do? Uh, I, I don't know exactly. Possibly report the matter to the exchange and see if Perling could be prosecuted for manipulation. Well, let's go over there and see what's what. <laughs> Item four, five dollars. Cab fare for myself and Morton Scotman to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange. Since I didn't understand too much about the board, I simply sat and kept an eye on Scotman. The pinstripe suit, the Hamburg, the tie, the shirt, the glasses. <laughs> Somehow he tickled me. I was beginning to like the guy. About 15 minutes before the place closed, he cleared his throat and touched my arm. Uh, I uh, suspicioned wrong, Mr. Dollar. There's been no manipulation on the exchange. I thought certainly if there had been any, it would appear in that Alabama company. <laughs> I was wrong, and I apologize for taking up your time. You're paying for it. Besides, I'm glad you did. Mm hmm? Shall we go? Yeah. Where? Well, we know he didn't have the story printed to cheat on the market, but we still have the same old question. What's that? Why did Perling pay that reporter to say he was dead? The reporter lied to you. You've uh, been lied to before, I'm sure. Oh, sure. And by experts. But she wasn't a good one. Not even halfway good. So I still believe her story. You believe that board up there? I believe that, too. Well, then? Perling had a reason for getting such a story printed. I want to find out about it. Expense account item five, four dollars. Lunch for Morton Scotman and myself. After lunch, I checked into the new Weston. Item six, fifty dollars deposit, car rental. A phone call to the offices of David Perling gave me the information that Mr. Perling was at his home on Long Island. I drove out there. A small estate greened up with all the lush things that happened there this time of the year. As I reached the place, I noticed a group of people in white flannels and dark blue jackets mixing cocktails on the terrace. One of them I recognized from previous newspaper pictures as David Perling. A middle-aged woman with iron-gray hair and the figure of a 16-year-old girl opened the door. She looked from behind dark glasses disapprovingly. Yes? How do you do? I'd like to see Mr. Perling, if I may. I'm Mrs. Perling. May I help you? Well, this is a business matter, Mrs. Perling. My name's Dollar, Eastern Liability and Trust Company. Well, he's not in now. I suggest you call his office and explain the nature of your business to his secretary. Good day, Mr. Dollar. Look, I know he's here. I saw him as I drove up. You are both impertinent and rude. I'm sure he'll see me if you give him my name and tell him I just came back from Key West. 
and that I had a long talk with a newspaper reporter down there. Since you saw so much as you drove up, you might have noticed that we're entertaining guests, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I noticed that. Wait here. I stood there a moment on the wide colonial porch and wondered what made me such a social outcast. A man who was tending the grounds walked by and turned on the sprinkling system. He waved at me and I waved back. I felt better. On the terrace, I could hear the tinkle of glasses and a little laughter now and then. Finally, David Perling showed up. He was a tall man with a hairline that started about an inch above the heaviest eyebrows I've ever seen. Two-toned shoes, white flannels, and a Mexican sports shirt fitted in with a broad shoulders and wide mouth grin that came off just briefly when he looked at me. My wife told me to throw you out. Can you think of any reason why I shouldn't? I'm about ten pounds lighter than you, but I might be a good fifteen years younger. Tell me what you want, kiddo, and then get out of here. I want you to tell me why you paid Gracie Edwards $100 to print a story about you being dead. Who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. What's all this to you? An investigation. There's no way you can prove I paid that girl to print that story. I know that. I was telling a friend of mine today that something probably could be proved about the boat, if it had to be. Then the reporter thing had come out. I don't know. You see, Eastern Liability had an idea that you might have had that story printed to cause a little action on the stock market. Who at Eastern Liability? I'll keep that to myself. Well, it doesn't make any difference anyhow. They're way off base. Or can't you figure that part? Mm, That's why I'm here. I figured that part. Suppose I told you I don't know what you're talking about. I'd ask you all over again. Tell you about a reporter and a boat. Dollar, you've gone this far, and it's probably as far as you're going. I'm not going to tell you anything. At least anything specific. I will tell you this much. I paid the reporter in cash. I paid the boatman the same way. Whatever reason I had, it was a good one. Meant to harm no one. You're sure about that, Mr. Perling? As sure as I'm going inside right now and mix another batch of martinis. For the second time in a matter of minutes, I was standing on a porch feeling like Typhoid Mary. Somehow I halfway believed David Perling. I also halfway believed that whatever reason he had meant something to me. All halfway thinking. If you want to be left alone, you don't slam a door once or even twice. You invite the asker of the question in, give him a drink, introduce him to your friend, slap him on the back, and lie through your teeth. You don't tell a man to leave, because that's the best way in the world to make him keep coming. So I waved at the friendly gardener once more, climbed into my rented car, drove back to the New Weston, and sat down with a magazine. Johnny Dollar. This is Celia Perling, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Perling. I think I should like to talk to you, Mr. Dollar. David told me why you were at the house. Mm -hmm. I'm downstairs in the lobby. I'll be right down, Mrs. Perling. I had to drive some friends in tonight, and I thought I'd stop and have this chat with you. I'm glad you did. Somewhat embarrassing. I mean, after the way I acted at the house. Oh, well, suppose we forget that part, Mrs. Perling. Does Mr. Perling know that you're here? No, I'll tell him when I get home. There's something I must know. What's that? You aren't just a sensation seeker or something like that, are you? Mrs. Perling, let me answer you this way. You came to me. How you found me, I don't know, but you did. You also found out I'm a legitimate investigator interested in facts, am I right? David called a friend of his with the Allied Bureau, and they told him you were an insurance investigator. Uh Uh-huh, and they also told you that when I work a case in New York, I generally stay at the New Weston. Is that about it? I'd like to ask you a question. Are you going to continue with this matter, the one you discussed with my husband this afternoon? I suppose I am. You mean you... you believe there was something ulterior in David having that story printed? Well, let's say I believe his answers about it were unsatisfactory. I'm the fellow who's supposed to find out why. Why? It's my job. I can assure you there wasn't anything wrong about it at all. It was a rather personal matter and certainly could harm no one. I'm glad to hear that. I heard it once before, though. Your husband said it to me today in practically the same words. Would you like to buy me a drink? Sure. Come on. We walked through the lobby to the cocktail lounge without a word. We sat down without a word, and I ordered a couple of bourbons and water. Still no word. All around us, people poured drinks, laughed, and talked. I glanced at Mrs. Perling from time to time and wore the blankest expression I knew how. Finally, it worked. She began in a small voice. We have a daughter, Mr. Dollar. Her name's Eugenia. Jeannie, we call her. Mm Mm-hmm. She's the reason for that story in the papers. Tell me about it. It's not easy, you know. It's... I mean, it's, it's admitting a prominent defeat to explain it. 
We're... David and myself are considered quite capable people. Capable at most everything. Business, home. Yeah, capable of everything except raising a child into a woman. I'd rather not go into the faults that we have, Mr. Dollar. No need to. Are they that obvious? I didn't mean that. I just mean it seems painful for you to even discuss this. I'll say it this way. We've had too much money and too little time to put it on... on Jeannie. Now we're suffering for it. How do you mean? Jeannie got sick and tired of being alone and unattended and not understood. She left home a year ago and we haven't seen her or heard from her since. She left a note saying that we never would. I suppose we deserve it. Well, I wouldn't try to judge that. We have no idea where she is, what she's doing, even if she's with someone. We just know she's gone. It's really quite ridiculous. Now that Jeannie's gone, we know how much we wanted her around. What about the police? Well, we... we didn't go to the police. I think you can understand why. I mean the publicity. Who did you go to? The Aimwell Agency. They've been working on it. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. Any luck? Not a sign of her. Do you understand now? Well, I don't understand everything. I'm sorry she's missing. But about the story in the paper... Well, Davy arranged that. I mean that his death would be reported. It was a crazy thing to do, I suppose. But we've tried everything else. He thought that if he were reported dead, Jeannie, wherever she was, was, would see the story and possibly contact me. You see, it's... It's unbearable knowing she's alive somewhere, hating us this way. We wanted another chance. No luck? No luck. Not a word. Not a word. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the trap is all baited. And guess who walks in? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Nineteenth, nineteen 1956, yours truly, Johnny Dollar on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you for tuning in. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. Uh, it's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you here each and every time we roll around. Now, we mentioned our webpage, classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand, learn more about Classic Radio Collecting. You can contact me there, and you can buy me a, uh, a copy. And, of course, uh, whatever money you put in that pot, I may buy me a Dr. Pepper with it, or even better, I may find us some more classic radio theater shows. There are some out there, and it's just a matter of getting a hold of them and researching them and finding some good, clean copies, or better, clean upable copies than we have right now. So if you go to the webpage, classicradio.stream, and you click on the Buy Me a Coffee link, I would appreciate that so much. And, of course, you can also find a link as to where our social media is and where all of our shows are available. 
Thanks for listening. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.